Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for coming back from lunch. I'm so happy the weather is better today. I'm glad that people are coming back. Um, so we've had a fascinating morning, um, which actually set up uh, this afternoon really, really well. Um, we've had a day of looking at the hot end of brain, brain research, behavioral research. Um, we had a lot of really interesting discussions around preventative health actually this morning. Um, and funnily enough, uh, longevity came up in the last session. So Jordan Schlein, who I don't know if he's here, but he, he actually uh, set, set the stage really well for this uh, session actually that we're, we're having now. We've got two sessions actually on the 100 year life. Um, the first one being uh, the beginning. Um, but what Jordan Schlein, he had some interesting ideas on whether we need a new Hi Hippocratic Oath. And he talked a lot about how you know, interventions that are spiraling uh, in healthcare at the moment may actually be causing us harm. And it kind of brought up this whole notion of, uh, you know, what really should we be doing to um, enable us to live a longer, happier life? And he made the point that actually most of us would like to live longer, especially if we're healthy. Um, not all of us, but most of us. Um, and, but when you ask, so if you ask you know, most people, they say, yeah, I do want to live longer. But if you ask, well, how are you going to do that? Most people don't have a strategy um, that they really thought hard about. Um, so we're going to be kind of looking at that you know, in these two sessions, uh, what it really means, open up the possibilities first, but then kind of look at uh, what we can do with this extra time that we've got. Um, but actually, the one uh, startling fact, which some of us may not realize, but uh, is worth mentioning, is that in some countries, um, life healthy, well, life expectancy is actually going down. In fact, uh, in the UK, um, our life expectancy has, for the first time in many years, actually gone down by six months. So that was some stats that came out. And so, um, so, we, so I think you know the discussion today will start to examine and, and unpick sort of what, what's really going on here, both in the UK but also globally. Um, so just a word on me before I, I kind of introduce our wonderful first panel. So I'm Tina Woods, I run Collider Health, I build ecosystems for change and impact. I've been very involved with the Colgex team here, pulling the festival together, um, and, and so great and so many wonderful people. But the other hat that I wear, which I guess is a bit more relevant for today, is I run a social enterprise called Longevity International, and we're running the all-party parliamentary group for longevity. And actually, uh, together with a, an astounding group of parliamentarians, including Damon Green, um, Norman Lamb, uh, Lord O'Shaughnessy, as well as a, a, an incredible group of um, advisory board uh, uh, leaders, scientists, industry leaders, um, we're pulling together our, um, our thinking uh, to design a national strategy for healthy longevity by, the year, by year end. Um, that which will, which will give five extra healthy years to all British citizens by 2035, something that the government has been speaking about, but actually is how do we do that? Because there's a lot of reports, there's a lot of stuff happening, there's a lot of money going everywhere, but actually how do we really um, tackle this goal? That is actually really achievable if we get it right. So we're looking at a lot of stuff there. So I think this will all come out in the discussion today, and of course Camilla Cavendish, who's speaking next, is actually on this group, and we'll be talking a little bit about that. So, um, now... Uh, we have an incredible panel, um, and uh, I'm going to introduce um, Jose Cordera first as our keynote speaker. Um, we have a, a, a group of panels, uh, panelists um, also uh, involved in today's discussion. Uh, we've got Martin Borsavsky, who's ex executive chairman at Prelude Fertility. We have Katerina Sofia Voltz, who is the CEO of Oxam's Razor. Um, we have Reason, who's the founder of Repair Biotechnologies. We have Polina Mamashina, who's just come in, which is great. She was um, in, uh, speaking yesterday on AI-driven drug research. Uh, incredible scientist in silico medicine. And uh, so before, I'm going to uh, mention a few words before Jose takes the stage. Now, I had to giggle a little bit when I was th thinking, how am I going to introduce Jose? Because I, I watched this YouTube um, uh, video of him, actually, in one of his talks. And, uh, and I noticed all the comments on the talk said, Jose is amazing, but it's taken four minutes of the MC to actually introduce him because he has so many incredible things that he's done in his life, so many titles. So I was kind of stuck, well, how am I going to introduce him with all these, this, you know, four minutes worth of all these titles of all the things that he's done in his life? So I'm going to try, I'll, I'll try, and, and then, of course, Jose will probably do better than me in describing what he's been doing. So Jose is the director of the Millennium Project. He is a founding faculty member of Singularity University, and, and uh, for all of you who know, it's, it's an incredible organization uh, on the, uh, in, uh, in California, you know, pioneering sort of thinking. 
He's a transhumanist. Um, he's also a friend of Ray Kurzweil, and I knew that because I heard Jose speak a little bit while ago. And of course, Ray, as you know, talks about singularity. So Jose is going to talk a little bit about that. Um, now, more recently, Jose um, started a political party on, uh, focused on longevity called Niel. He ran for the European Parliament. I'll let Jose tell you what happened. But I think what was interesting about that is he's recognized that, and I think all of us who are in this space, is that the pace of change is so fast, government and business are kind of really struggling to keep up. In fact, it's getting worse. Um, so with that, and he's also written a book, The Death of Death. So I'm going to hand you over to Jose, who's going to wow us on the possibilities of living a longer, healthy life. And then we're going to go into the panel discussion. So welcome to Jose. So uh, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be back here in London to talk about uh, uh, what I see happening in the next few years, which I, I wrote a book about, it, which is called La Muerte de la Muerte, for those of you who can uh, read in Spanish. Uh, it will be in English next year. Um, the book has been a bestseller in Spain and actually put me into politics. Uh, the two biggest parties in Spain, one from the right and one from the left, they told me, why don't you come with us? Uh, because we believe we should take this longevity issue. So uh, when the left and the right both approached me, I said, well, something good is this about longevity, so we should not be with either party. So we created a new party called Miel. Miel is honey in, in, in Spanish. Unfortunately, uh, we did it very quickly in only three months, and I, I did not get elected to the European Parliament, but this is only the beginning. And why? Because Spain is a very particular country that soon will have the highest life expectancy in the world. Right now, that record is held by Japan, but Spain by 2040 will have the longest life expectancy and an uh, aging population very fast. Um, you might know that in the Spanish flag it says... Uh, plus Ultra. Uh, Spain is the country of Plus Ultra, which is far beyond. But I think we should move from uh, just far beyond to far beyond with life. More life, better life. And so that is what I'm working on to try to take these ideas. Um, Spain has uh, incredible scientists working on longevity research. Many of you might have um, heard or read the articles by Juan Carlos Ispizua Belmonte. He is the scientist who was able to rejuvenate mice 40%, and now he's doing even more. Or another person, which is very important, the head of the Cancer Research Center in Spain, Maria Blasco, who wrote a book called um, How to Live, How to Die Young at 140 Years. Actually, that is in the book presentation, and the scientist is the one in the center, and the small lady is my mother. And... Uh, she was really excited when she said how to die young at 140. But then I, I told the scientists that is only the first edition. The second edition should be how to die young at 140,000 years. And the third edition is how not to die. So I believe we are moving into this very fast. And Spain, again, has top scientists. I organized a, a big conference in the National Science Foundation of Spain a couple of years ago talking about longevity and rejuvenation. And also last year, we held a transhumanist uh, yearly event in the Ateneo de Madrid, where we are talking not just about biological immortality, but also computational immortality. And for that, we invited Sofia, the human a humanoid robot that actually spoke in uh, COG X, I think, last year. And um, Sofia opened the event speaking in the four official languages of Spain that no human can speak. Sofia spoke in Basque, in Catalan, in Galician, and in Castilian. No human can speak those four languages, uh, but Sofia can. And Sophia is just an example of how we are going to reach also digital immortality in the next two decades. Um, so I am a good friend of Aubrey de Grey. Many of you probably know him. And Aubrey de Grey has been uh, talking about these ideas for over two decades. And at that time, he was called crazy, charlatan. Uh, fortunately, he's getting closer and closer to the things he said. So I collaborate with him widely in, uh, in Latin America as well, and in the USA where we organized a yearly event, and I want to invite you to come to Las Vegas in October to the revolution against aging and death. Uh, in this event, actually, you might uh, see top 
top people like Ray Kurzweil, Aubrey de Grey, and if you look at the bottom right, uh, Liz Parrish. She is the first human that is undergoing two treatments for rejuvenation today. So if you really want to see how these rejuvenation treatments might be in the future and you want to meet her and see if she is really younger than when she began almost three years ago, come to Las Vegas. Um, so this is my book and I'm so happy uh, because this book uh, with a British co-author, by the way, David Good is my co-author. He is a mathematician from Cambridge University. And I also studied in Cambridge, but Cambridge, Massachusetts. I am an engineer from MIT. And both of us decided to get together and to write about longevity and what is happening because there is a total disruption in medicine. And this disruption does not come from medicine. It comes from computer science. And that is why medical doctors don't see this disruption coming. So the book actually during book day that you might know it's... Uh, uh, St. George's Day, uh, April 23rd, became the number one and number five book on health in Spain. And you might wonder, how can it be number one and number five at the same time? And the reason is number one in paper and number five in Kindle. And overall in sales in Spain and Latin America, it was number 10. So um, I'm really proud of this book that has had this impact, and then it has taken me into politics to take these ideas. I have done a lot of TV programs with uh, History Channel, Discovery Channel, and um, with my friend Aubrey de Grey that was ridiculized by the magazine of my alma mater, MIT, and I'm very upset that the MIT Technology Review made fun of Aubrey de Grey. And so he actually made a bet. Uh, in a technology review, if anyone could prove that he was wrong, that uh, they, good, they could get $20,000. Fortunately, for us, for the people who believe in longevity extension, no one could claim, no one has claimed that bet, those $20,000. And Aubrey de Grey has been revindicated a lot. So, with my other friend, uh, Ray Kurzweil, who has become familiar, about um, popularized the idea of the singularity and Aubrey de Grey that has popularized the idea of the Methuselarity. By the way, the Methuselarity, uh, Ray Kurzweil uh, believes will happen in the year 2029, that is 10 years from now. The Methuselarity is also called longevity escape velocity. And this is the time we believe in 10 years that if you arrive by, by 2029, you will live uh, long enough to live forever. Because by that time, in 10 years, we will have the technologies to extend our lifespan continuously. And for every year you live, you will get an extra year. But it's still aging, and still aging. Aging will be reversed at the latest, we believe, in 2045, which is also the year of the technological singularity, but it is the year of the treatments available to anyone, almost for free, for rejuvenation. Anyway, most peop some people still don't believe in this, um, and I like to quote the Bible, not because I'm very biblical, but the last enemy that uh, will be destroyed is death. But people still don't get this, and um, philosopher, German philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer said that all truth goes through three stages. The first stage is that it is ridiculized. Second, it is violently attacked. And number three, it will be accepted as self-evident. I think we have moved from phase one into phase two, but soon we will get to, become, to believe that this is self-evident. And I plan to be alive, and I hope you too, by 2029 and by 2045. And when we look back to today, we will remember how primitive we were today, that we would let people die. Um, in, the, in the book, we explain a lot of what is happening, and political parties are being born, like the U.S. Transhumanist Party. In Britain, there is also a Transhumanist Party. In Germany, they created also a movement, the Health Research Party, which is a longevity party. And even in East London, a friend of mine ran for the European Parliament with a longevity agenda. So we had groups in Britain in Germany and in Spain talking about longevity. But our uh, uh, campaign was very fast. We didn't have enough time, but we expect to, to do a lot of advances uh, soon in the next few years. So this is my German friend, Felix Wirth, who leads the 
a health research party, longevity party, immortalist party, even though we don't, we should not use that word many times, especially in politics, the I word, the immortality word. But we believe we will live long enough to live indefinitely, as long as we want. Anyway, so with my friends, we decided to do this also in Spain, so we created this movement, and we have had a lot of uh, media coverage, and uh, we support many of these e international events. Also in Berlin, I highly recommend that you go to Undoing Aging, because this is what science is being done. This is basically a scientific event, and they talk also about experimental treatments with animals. And it is very important to see what is being done today with mice, with dogs, with cats, or even a small... Uh, animals like worms. Worms have been extended their lifetimes already 10 times. We have already Methuselah worms. The Methuselah worms that live the equivalent of a thousand human years. And scientists don't make these Methuselah worms because they love worms. They do this because these will have implications on humans. So this was my party, United in Diversity, uh, talking about how to increase um, um, well-being. We are called Somos Miel. Uh, everything was based in the book, and I just want to finish with a, a couple of ideas because people don't understand exponential technologies. And I want to show you, because uh, I still have two minutes, uh, quickly, how technology is changing. Uh, 30 years ago, we used this for computer science. If you remember the IBM punch card, this is 10 by 100, 10 by, times 100 makes 1,000. This is 1K. I used this until the first electromagnetic memories were invented. And I have an example here. This was also 1K, the first generation. But this 1K you could erase. But 30 years ago, we had one mechanical K and one electromagnetic K. In Spanish, we say K and K. So how much is 1K plus 1K? One caca. We had one caca of technology. Fortunately, we moved from caca, we moved to these 512 uh, uh, cacas, then f uh, these 1.4 megas, and today, uh, probably you have many pen drives, this one is 128 gigas. In 30 years, we have gone from caca to gigas. So what do you think is going to happen in the next few years for technology? But again, now this is applicable to medicine, to biology. The Human Genome Project took 13 years to sequence at a cost of $3 billion. Now you can sequence your full genome uh, in a few hours for uh, maybe $500. Actually, here we are, NHSX will be doing a campaign to sequence the genome of 5 million Britons. Okay, this will be basically be free. Why? Again, because the human genome is not so big. It is only 3 gigabytes. And this pen drive is 128 gigabytes. So how many humans can we fit here? 128 gigabytes divided by 3 gigabytes? Okay, uh, let me make my politically incorrect joke. Here I can put the genome of... Um, 42 Englishmen and one Scotsman. <laughs> anyway, so uh, technology is moving very fast. It's rich in biology, medicine. There is a total, complete disruption in medicine in the next few years. And we are living in incredible times. We are between the last human mortal generation and the first human immortal generation. I hope that many of you are like me that don't plan to die. And even better, in 2045, we expect to be younger. Not older, but younger, thanks to the advances in biotechnology. So anyway, thank you so much. It is a pleasure to be here and to talk about the incredible times we are living in today. Thank you. So we've got lots of questions, but I'm going to be a little bit cheeky and I'm going to have, I've got one question I'm going to ask each of the panelists right now. How long do you want to live? So I'm going to start with Polina. Well, I would say 150 and then it depends on the state of the health. I don't want just to live longer, I want to live a healthy life. Maybe if I will become 
healthier by 150 or something. Some years ago, I wrote an article entitled The Million Year Lifespan. You can Google that. It's a uh, blow by blow of how that could plausibly be achieved using technologies we can envisage. Of course, step one is cure aging, which is uh, a little bit of a big hurdle, that one. The rest of it's pretty easy after that, though. A million years would be a nice start. You might have trouble thinking about what you might be at that point, so see how it goes. Martin. Well, my work is in fertility, so I can tell you that frozen embryos can live for millions of years in the sense that they could probably become people in a million years. As far as people, I think I, I thought I was an optimist until I heard Jose. Uh, I, I, wow, now I'm like uh, such a conservative and I don't want to be the conservative person in the panel. But people die in all sorts of ways, not just you can make them genetically and they can die in accidents, they can get infectious diseases, they can. So I think it's a pretty complex question to answer. Katarina? Yeah, s similar. I would like to live, you know, um, for as long as I can if I'm healthy and of full human potential and can actually make the impact in this world that I want to make. Um, also, considering, you know, the environmental challenges that we have and other problems in the world, if we can resolve these. Sure, I want to live forever, but if we are not resolving these, there's no point, right? Then I'd rather want to die. And Jose is? Um, as I said before, I don't plan to die, so I plan to live <laughs> indefinitely. Mm -hmm. I plan to be immortal. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to just do a, a bit of a show of hands. Who wants to live forever? So, well, you know, quite a few people, actually. <laughs> So that's an interesting, so, but I think what, what's, uh, what's interesting that we've just heard is I think there is a little bit of qualification around, well, I would like to live longer if, and the healthy bit also came out as well, the happier bit. So um, can, I hope everyone can hear me. So I'm going to, so we're going to take a little bit of time. We're going to, we're going to um, let each of our panelists uh, introduce themselves, tell us a little bit um, where they're coming from, and then we'll go into a Q&A. So I'll start with Polina. So my name is Polina and I'm a senior research scientist at Silicon Medicine. Uh, it's a bioinformatics company that focused on um, applications of AI, in particular deep learning for drug discovery and development uh, of new biomarkers. So I'm leading the biomarker development team and in Silicon we also focused on finding new therapies against uh, age-related disorders. I'm Reason. I'm a long-term patient advocate for rejuvenation research and development. I've been doing this for going on 20 years now, I guess. I've been writing Fight Aging for much of that time. I did some investment in the field for the past few years and then caught investor disease and started a company, Repair Biotechnologies, which I am the co-founder of. It seems better to be doing rather than talking about doing. Uh, I'm Martin Varsavsky. I built the largest chain of fertility clinics in the U.S. That's called Prelude. And we're working on an embryology equipment company that it's a machine that makes human embryos. Uh, so my focus is at the very beginning of life and not the potential no end of life. Uh, but I think if you study embryos, you can learn a lot about longevity. And I think the same mechanisms that regulate embryos regulate old people. Mm -hmm. I agree. Hi, my name is Katerina Sofia Waltz, and I'm the CEO and founder of Occam's Razor. And what we are doing is to use machine learning algorithms to find curative treatments for Parkinson's disease. So where I'm coming from is really, um, you know, over 19 years, actually exactly 19 years ago, um, Bill Clinton has announced that the Human Genome Project has been uh, completed. The first draft of the human genome has been uh, completed. And he stated that uh, you know, we, have, uh, we have lists of genes that are associated to certain diseases. So we, we are trying to find specific genes associated to certain diseases. And this, uh, these lists should help us find effective treatments for all of these diseases. However, uh, you know, turns out that the predictive value of this uh, of the scientific uh, of these genetic risk information has actually been quite low. So in 2010, we were supposed to have effective uh, uh, diagnostics for these diseases, and by 2015, 
at the same conference, they announced that we should have, by 2015, uh, treatments for all of these diseases. However, biology is much more complex than that. And this reductionist view of biology, the view that there is a certain gene for each disease, has led us do down the wrong path. So now today in biology, we know that it's much more complex than that. It is really around the complex interactions that are happening within the cell and outside of the cell of these thousands of biological uh, counterparts, like the genes and RNA and proteins and cell organelles. And we need to understand how they are connected and interdependent to find treatments so that we can find, you know, and interfere at one step or at multiple steps of these biological cascades. So it's similar to, you know, having a, a, if you are asking a mechanic who's trying to fix an electrical arrow in a car, you would not try to do this without having a wiring diagram of what is happening. And I believe we need to have a wiring diagram of what is happening in biology, what is happening with the cellular processes, so that we can identify what is broken and that we can effectively fix um, these diseases at the right place. And so this is what we are doing with uh, Occam's Race. We are generating these wiring diagrams to um, correctly identify what, uh, what and where to target. Thank you, Ka Thank you, Katerina. Um, just a point that I'm going to ask Jose. I'm going to then ask um, Reason and uh, Polina a little bit, drilling it down a little bit more. You mentioned how computer science has actually been driving a lot of what we're seeing now. And of course, I know, and Katerina, of course, is doing incredible work kind of you know, identifying all the, the, the interesting patterns and data across different silos and different areas and this whole omics sort of piece. Um, but just uh, a, a little word on just trying to really, um, I, I think, uh, understanding really how we can halt aging in its tracks, as it were. Um, and maybe a word from Paulina and Reason about how what they're doing relates to that. Jose, do you want to just comment on that? Um, well, first, um, one of the things I say about aging is that uh, I consider it as a disease, but a curable disease. And thanks to the advances in artificial intelligence, now we can understand the three gigabytes of the genome, and we can find the mutations that create cancer. Cancer cells are biologically immortal. And now that we can sequence the genome of the good cell versus the genome of the cancer cell, see the differences and see why cancer cells are immortal. So we truly live in incredible times, and AI will help us to solve all these problems. That is also why Microsoft has announced that in one decade they will cure cancer. They are using uh, computer science to cure cancer. So just, Polina, just a little bit on, on what you're doing and the role of biological clocks in your research and how that's helping you understand what's really happening in the aging process. So we use uh, different kinds of algorithms, uh, especially deep learning algorithms, so those uh, AI algorithms that generated a lot of hype recently and been shown really, r shown really credible advances in machine vision, autonomous driving, etc. So we use those to identify some um, molecules in our body that we can measure and quantify to see how old we are biologically. Because we know that even if you're chronologically 30, for example, it doesn't mean that you're going to die as other people who are 30 right now and you're probably biologically <coughs> different from them. Uh, in terms of age, so we use those um, so-called clocks to predict age of individuals, and then uh, we can use those clocks for various applications. For example, you can even run uh, clinical trials for anti-aging therapies. You can design a proper clinical trial uh, when you can measure the outcome and see whether you're able to rejuvenate people, and you don't have to wait actually for them to die to see how their lifespan changed. You just do this in a short setting time. So those tools are really powerful. At the same time, we can also use them to evaluate the, um, our lifestyle choices, whether they're smoking or other factors are making us uh, older or younger. So yeah, we use those different tools to, to, to create those aging clocks. And Reason, just a little bit more about how the work that you're doing in regenerative medicine, how it's helping us really understand what is happening at the heart of the aging process and where so the future is. At, uh, at Repair Biotechnologies, we're very much proponents of de Grey's view of aging as an accumulation of fundamental damage and the downstream consequences of that damage. This is not just an airy statement. These, these forms of damage are very well catalogued, very well described, 
Um, we know what the end results are in aging, obviously, and we know what the starting point is. You might consider it um, analogous to rust in a very complicated metal sculpture. You cannot possibly guess how the sculpture is going to fall apart after 20 years in the salt water, but rust is very, very simple. It's the complexity of the statue that makes it complex. It's the same with aging. Aging is a matter of very simple forms of damage at root and very complicated consequences. So you can intervene at the root, which is easy, quote unquote, in comparison, or you can intervene later, which is what most of medicine has tried to do for the past hundred years and failed miserably because it's too complicated, it's too hard, and they aren't addressing the underlying damage. So the name of our company, Repair Biotechnologies, is sort of a note to self don't do things that are not actually repairing the damage because if you go down that path you're just doing the same thing that everybody else did before. The two things we picked, we picked for our current programs because they are low-hanging fruit. One of them is uh, restoration of the thymus which is the organ that helps produce T-cells um, for the adaptive immune system and the adaptive immune system falls over badly with age that causes cancer risk to climb, that causes senescent cells to accumulate, that causes uh, malfunctions in regeneration, you know, the list is endless. If you can help to restore the aged immune system, you're doing something useful and the immune system will contribute to further repair. Um, that is a decent example of what you can do in repair if you're not actually picking something directly out of DeGray's list and fixing that, like the senolytics community is right now, destroying senescent cells. But if you look at medicine, if you really want to understand medicine and what it can do for aging, you have to look at it and say, is this therapy actually repairing something that causes aging and age-related degeneration? If the answer is no, it's just messing with metabolism and trying to make it better to resist the damage, which is true of a lot of therapies these days, then the results are not likely to be that great. For every success, like mTOR inhibitors, there are 999 other failures, drugs where somebody tried to mess with the complicated end state of aging metabolism and found that they couldn't do anything useful for the vast majority of people who tried the drug you need to be fixing the underlying damage. Strike at the root. I'm going to ask, thank you, Reason. I'm going to ask a question of Martin, actually, because we talk about, you know, all of us living longer. And in fact, you know, what happens there, of course, is women are tending to delay um, having their children. Of course, that then has created this whole challenge now that we have women who realize, oh, gosh, too late to, for me to have children. Um, how do you think, so, so uh, just a comment, I guess, in how this is opening up, I guess, the field of fertility research. I mean, if we're all going to be living longer, Presumably, we're going to need to we're going to need more fertility help. Yeah, no, it, it's a very good question because this is the first generation of women that's going to live more in menopause than in fertility, right? And so we make all this progress, we live much longer, but the fertility window has stayed the same. Obviously, humans are genetically programmed for their fertility window. Humans also have some kind of day counters where things are activated according to their age. And sometimes we call that the biological clock. So the, what we have found so far is not a true solution to this problem in terms of getting, let's say, a 45-year-old woman to have children, which very few can, but to, to get 45-year-old women to have children provided that they store their eggs when they were younger or receiving egg donations for women who uh, donate their eggs for them uh, Prelude is the largest uh, provider of egg freezing services in the U.S., especially in New York and San Francisco, where there's a, a big trend towards egg freezing. Egg freezing is, is certainly a solution. It makes it much more likely to have babies later in life, which kind of makes a lot of sense because we live so much longer. Now, in this more science fiction scenario that we're talking about here, where people live hundreds of years, there's going to be a number of biological questions, but a number of social political questions as to how many people would uh, have children in a world like that. Uh, things such as pension system, who's going to support your children, if your parents are, are alive forever or they aren't, or when is the role of the children. But in terms of biology, 
we're not able to free sex, sperm, embryos, truly forever. In that, in liquid nitrogen, in that sense, well, I don't believe people will live forever. I believe that embryos, eggs in liquid nitrogen, the word forever uh, sort of applies. Uh, so I, I think there's a lot of, there's a revolution going on right now that we don't need to wait uh, for it to happen. So Jose, I'm going to pose a question to you because of course, I mean, it sounds in, in many ways, you know, fantastic that we can live longer, you know, have, we can all make our own choice about how, how much longer we'd like to live, but um, how, I mean, the, the, what Martin has just mentioned, I mean, the, the impact on society, all these sorts of things. And, and I think, you know, um, linked to that is this whole perception of this longevity industry, which has gotten, a, you know, it has had a bit of, you know, it's been tainted a little bit by some of the thinking in Silicon Valley, you know, the billionaires wanting to live forever and, you know, the whole kind of snake oils and all the rest of it. Just a comment on how do we need to see this whole um, area sort of, I guess, ethically recognizing the impacts and all the sort of societal um, issues, you know, at stake? Well, I think that life is fantastic and living longer should be even more fantastic. Also, um, people need to understand that this is going to be cheap or basically free. And why this is going to be eventually free? Because we are very cheap. Human beings, we are water bags, as you probably know. We are 70% water, and we are not uh, Evian water or Perrier water. We are water from the Thames, tap water, 70% of us. The other 30% that makes a human is the most uh, common and simple elements in the planet, carbon, potassium, nitrogen, sodium. So we are really only water bags, and we don't cost even $100. So to maintain something that is so cheap as we are, once we get to the atomic molecular level, it will be dirty cheap. So people need to understand that at the beginning it will be expensive, and it will not work out. Like all technologies, they begin very expensive and they don't work very well. But when they are democratized, they will be used by everybody and they will work. So people need to understand that this is coming very fast because the changes are exponential. So we really live in incredible times and we need to advance this research so that it reaches everybody as soon as possible. And uh, also talking to Reason, we were talking, what will change our mentality? once we have the first treatments. And the treatments are already beginning with animals also. You probably have seen now, you can actually almost double the lifespan of a dog. Uh, Professor George Church at Harvard, Harvard University, he has a company in order to rejuvenate dogs. Once people see that their dogs live longer, they say, oh, if, they, if it works for the dog, it might work for me. Okay, so these treatments will be available first for animals because there are also less regulations and because animals live shorter lives. Therefore, you can see if their lives are increasing. You cannot wait for a human because we die in the middle of the experiment if it takes a, a, a century or two centuries. Anyway, so I think people need to understand that this is going to be cheap, available for anyone who wants it, and that the treatments will be arriving first with animals and people will like it because people like their animals and people like their lives. Thank you, Jose. So I'm gonna um, pose a question uh, both to Katerina and Polina, actually. Um, so how do you think, um, with, with the work that you're doing, with, with reference to the work that you're doing, the hard edge of science to kind of address this, I guess, credibility issue that we have had in this space? I mean, how, how do you respond to that? How do you think science is gonna, you know, basically convert the cynics? I mean, I think there's still a lot of uh, scientific studies to be done that really evaluate you know, some of the claim claims that are being made. So we need to have um, clinical trials for, you know, let's say, aging-related uh, disorders or if we can actually stop uh, aging, not in an animal model only or in a cell, but actually in humans. Right? So some of the work that you're doing, um, Martin, I think is very interesting because we can actually study an embryo um, much better than <coughs> us complex human beings who are adults um, and we can do some very uh, like some we can do some good studies to evaluate um, aging or um, other scientific questions it is very very difficult to do that 
to do that for uh, humans, and these trials take a very long time. And generally, in the stem cell biology and regenerative medicine uh, field, and my PhD actually is in that field uh, from Stanford, um, we are just starting to begin to um, do clinical trials around, for instance, induced pluripotent stem cell derived um, um, cell types that we are transplanting into humans. So that means essentially there have been great progresses that have been made, but we are still at the beginning to actually put them into human trials uh, and get understanding on how they play out. Martin, you wanted to yeah, add I just, to that. I just wanted to add, yeah, that I, I agree with the embryos. The, so far, the only genetically modified human beings we have are these children that were just born in China out of a rogue experiment that a lot of people condemn, and I also feel it's clearly inadequate the way it was done. Mm -hmm. But the fact that these uh, twins got their uh, DNA altered by certain genes that prevent uh, HIV and malaria, if you're going to work on animals or humans that live or that age up to a certain point and stop aging, or if you, there's clearly a program for aging. But aging is, a, is in our DNA. If we didn't age, we wouldn't be here, we would all be bacteria. Evolution needs death. Without death, there's no evolution. Uh, that's a, but now that we've taken evolution in our hands and we can uh, create humans, and we have created uh, genetically modified humans, um, I think that working uh, with embryos, of course, it's not going to make the people who are in this room live any longer. <laughs> it's going to be a new generation of genetically modified animals, genetically modified plants, potentially genetically modified humans. It is much easier to work on an embryo than to work on a person who's alive and whose genes are expressing everywhere. Of course, there's a lot of demand for that, but I'm just saying it's harder. Absolutely. And Polina, just your perspective on yeah, so snake oils. As Catherine said, and I said before, we should run clinical trials and uh, probably work a bit with pharma. And as Reason said, there are those therapies that are already out there, like uh, Rapalox, and uh, pharmaceutical companies are testing them, of course, not directly as an agent as an indication, because it's a little bit hard without having an agent as a disease to run such clinical trials. You're just not able to, to, to file the, the claim to FDA and to uh, put it um, uh, at a, as a proper clinical trial. But we have to have some tools that will help us to measure the effectiveness of those treatments. This is why we're so focused on, on aging biomarkers by themselves. But yeah, as I mentioned, the number of uh, drugs available, like metformin, and uh, there is a trial right now run by Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York, uh, which is a five-year trial. They put people on metformin, and they uh, see how their all-cause mortality and also specific mortalities related to different disorders change over time. Um, and we can always say that most of the diseases that we have right now, the age-related diseases, so if you have a cure from cancer, you're kind of delaying the aging process. While we know that if we cure cancer, we're going to increase our lifespans by two, three years, not much on average. Uh, so probably cardiovascular disorders are others that we should intervene with. So I would say that we already have some therapies out there. People just don't realize that they actually are targeting some of the core aging processes. They Without are, dramatic effect, as you were saying, it, but you know, it's, it's um, destroying one disease at a time is not the way to think about things. It's this is the old school approach to aging. Yeah, it's true. the one that failed, because you you can't deal with that. You're dealing with an end manifestation if you tackle a specific disease. These these mTOR inhibitors working on calorie restriction mimetics, senescent cell destruction, all of these things have broad effects on pretty much all diseases of aging. They postpone them all or reverse them all in some cases because they affect common mechanisms that contribute to all of these conditions and that is how we should think about aging. It's not a collection of things that just randomly happen at the same time. It's a collection of consequences that are all happening at the same time because of the underlying reasons and until we target those reasons deliberatively we will continue to do badly in the matter of treating aging as a medical condition. And reason, I just wanted to ask you one question based on our conversation that we just had right before uh, the session. We actually have a lot of things that we can do now which would have a dramatic impact. I mean, just going back to uh, existing drugs, this you is, know, a couple of examples, and why, isn't it hap why aren't we doing more of that now? So, you know, if you know enough 
um, about what is going on in the labs, um, it is very hard to walk past an old person in the street because you know that if they just knew they could spend about $150 and a few weeks of their time and radically improve their life and probably lengthen their life by some years. So I don't know if any of you are familiar with senolytics, which are drugs that just selectively destroy senescent cells. Senescent cells accumulate in your body as you age, and they are actively maintaining an inflammatory, degraded state of your tissues. If you remove them, that inflammatory, degraded state goes away very quickly, in fact, in a matter of days. People undergoing trials for these, these drugs are reporting quite impressive effects, um, in fact. Not all of those trials are published, but I happen to know some of the people who are running them. These, these effects are large enough, and the drugs' effects in animals are reliable enough and large enough that, that it, it's very tempting to say, to hell with trials. We know what the pharmacology of these drugs are. We know they are safe in the amounts that you would take to get a senolytic effect that should, in theory, have a very high chance of curing people's arthritis, of curing inflammatory bowel disease, of turning back Alzheimer's disease, of taking any inflammatory condition of aging and having a strong chance of curing it in an old person. Do we really have to sit here and not say anything when there are 60 million people suffering arthritis in the US and the comparative number in this country. Should we just say, go, go you people, take these drugs. They're not, at, at worst, they will do nothing. We know this, we know their pharmacology. The drugs Fisetin, Dasatinib, Quercetin, Pipolongimine, these are all senolytic drugs that stand a very strong chance of improving everybody's health and life to a very large degree if they are over 60. What right do we have to stay silent and force that through the trial system? That is a position. Thank you, Reason. So Martin wanted to add to that, and then I've got no, a I, I disagree with this concept of to hell with trials. If we had uh, no trials, we had no science. Um, so I totally disagree with that. What I believe is in easier, easier, sometimes accelerated trials for terminal illnesses or for things. I mean, we could criticize the system, make it better, but if we went on to a system that is to the hell with trials, we would never know much. That's my view. To hell with trials in this case, <laughs> not throwing them out eternally. <laughs> uh, only in this case. Okay, only, we, only in we, this can case. we can agree to disagree on this point. Um, <laughs> but I think I'm going to ask my final question because I know we're running out of time. Um, uh, we talked a lot, actually, the whole run up to today and, uh, has talked a lot about the whole kind of prevention aspect. And of course, I know Katerina, you're very involved in the whole kind of omics revolution in a sense. What, and we know also, uh, uh, Jose talked actually about the costs coming down, obviously genetic testing, all these sorts of things. What do you think is the role of the consumer in all this? I mean, we've got DNA tests which people can, can buy now for less than the cost of an Amazon, I mean, uh, Amazon Echo. You know, how, you know we, we know there's a lot of stuff out there in terms of you know, what we can do in terms of understanding our risk of disease, you know, lifestyle, nutrition, the whole epigenetics piece. Um, which we can, you know, things that we can influence. Where do you think that's, how big of a role do you think that will play and how does that figure in with what you're doing, Katerina? Well, I think, you know, to just have genetic tests and understand, um, you know, what is your uh, genetic uh, disposition for a certain disease is not enough, right? We have now, even though it's getting cheaper and cheaper to be sequenced, we know a lot of the genes that are involved, for instance, is Parkinson's disease. There's this gene that has been discovered 15 years ago with the genome-wide association study called LURC2. And we know this is a main genetic driver of, um, of uh, genetic Parkinson's. And now, 15 years later, you know, we still don't understand what this gene is actually doing. There are some trials around it that are trying to target and inhibit this uh, kinase. It's a specialized protein that is putting phosphatex and other proteins to activate or inactivate things that are happening in the cell. But if you are inhibiting that, you are essentially taking a hammer and smashing it on the biggest network and everything gets shut down in the cell. Yeah. So one problem that I see in the pharmaceutical industry is that, again, we have this reductionist approach. We are looking at um, at diseases being caused all by genes, but it's not as simple as that. You know, biology is much more complex. There are so many different, uh, so many different uh, processes that are happening. There are very complex and huge um, biological networks, and I believe we need to map these out, and we, do, we need to understand um, with these networks. You know, what are even better questions we need to ask? What are yeah. hypotheses we should? 
um, as to what, um, how to actually treat these diseases. And then we are doing legitimate experiments um, and we'll learn from these experiments and you know, integrate that back into the network to actually get a whole understanding of what is happening. So I know that's where machine learning and, and, and all that is obviously absolutely critical with the work that you're doing and understanding the Parkinson, as it were. Um, Polina, I'm just going to, I think I probably have one, yes, I'm going to ask a final question to you because I know you've been doing so much interesting work, aging clocks, you know, microbiome, etc. Final statement on just the sort of our understanding of prevention in, in, in the omics space and context. Well, microbiome is definitely one of the areas you should think of. The problem is it's relatively recent, so if you think about genome that was sequenced a long time ago, we still have struggles with having proper reference of genome because it was a combination of multiple people and there is a lot of diversity there. The same for microbiome. We're not fully understand what's happening uh, out there. Uh, there are more reliable clocks, uh, like epigenetic clocks that can predict your age and uh, age-associated changes in your body, are relatively good. If you think about your facial, um, facial features that you have, they also can predict uh, pretty good your age. Uh, this is why we can probably rank ourselves and other people around us by age groups. So there are uh, several clocks that are out there already available for, for people to test and to test therapies. And we know that there are people already uh, in, 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 in the stage of uh, organizing those clinical trials for known therapies like Rapalogs that have been mentioned today and uh, senescent therapies. Uh, so we can first text, test clocks. So we know those therapies extend lifespan. Now we have to test clocks whether we're able to reverse them. So we have an individual in therapy, you see, can you reverse the clock by, by somehow a couple of years, something like this. And after that, we will go with those clocks and test new therapies. So Fantastic. this is happening now. And final comment from Jose, and we're running out of time, uh, but final comment. Well, uh, I just want to emphasize again that there is a complete disruption of yeah. what we thought was medicine. And, and the treatments we have today are so obsolete in the future. Radiotherapy, chemotherapy, this treatments should not be used. It's like bloodletting, bloodletting a hundred years ago. At Harvard, they would do bloodletting. All the students would learn bloodletting a hundred years ago. So there is a disruption. That is why Amazon, Google, Facebook, IBM are entering health. So the uh, computer science people are beginning to understand science, especially because of the human genome sequence and all of that. And the costs are increase, decreasing rapidly. So I am, this is the best time to be alive. And thanks to the new technologies, we will be living longer, healthier, happier lives. Thank you so much, Jose, for that final note of optimism. So I'm going to, um, we're going to have to meet the speaker at the, um, through the back doors if anyone would like to ask more questions. Our next session is starting almost immediately. So big round of applause for my wonderful um, speaker. <laughs>